we love to kill ourselves over stuff, right? It's like, it didn't work out today. I'm a bad person. I started a fight. I said a mean thing. Uh, I ran out of dog food. So I gave my dog some of my past, like whatever it is, we're so ready to just um, be so vicious to ourselves and to others. Mm-hmm. And I think if we could just be easier, not only would our health improve, but I think a lot more starts to go your way. Susie Moore, I have been watching you shine your light for years. I'm so grateful that our mutual friend, Kathy Heller, has introduced us. I feel like this is so long overdue, and I couldn't be more grateful that we are sitting down today for our first official girlfriend chat of getting to know each other, exploring what's going on in your life, talking about your new book, and whatever else the universe has designed for us. So welcome to the Divine Living Podcast. Thank you, Gina. I'm so thrilled and psyched. I mean, there's nothing I love more than speaking to another girl about all things. (laughs) Yes. Talking about all things, I mean, I don't mean to dive right in, but honey, I mean, I am so touched with this masterpiece that you've written from clearly the heart. And you know, um, we're going to talk more about, well, here, I guess we're talking about it now. Stop checking your likes, shake off the need for approval and live an incredible life. Mm -hmm. If you think that this title is even one one hundredth of what you're about to get in this book, I, ladies run, don't walk and buy copies for all your girlfriends. Um, you know, I think that one of the greatest gifts of this generation of women is breaking it all open Mm -hmm. and getting real. And I know my own edges and hesitation of like, well, I'll share this much, but I know that I'm, you know, like that much is reserved for, you know, either someone I'm paying to be (laughs) confidential Uh, or like vault with the inner circle of girlfriends. And I just, feel like there couldn't possibly be anything that you have held back on after reading this book. Well, Gina, believe it or not, I have. <laughs> There'll be plenty more books, I hope. But I, I, I mean, thank you for saying so. I feel as if it's really, um, it's really valuable and fun and freeing to just put some, put some secrets out there, right? You know, your secrets can own you a little bit and the things that can make you feel shame. And so if you mm-hmm. just say, yeah, grew up on welfare, mental illness, my family, addiction, etc." cetera. Um, a lot of people have experienced not similar things, but similar emotions. We can relate on a human level. So I think it's a very generous thing to do to share your story. And I hope more and more people do it. I love consuming stories, real yeah. stories from real people. So thank you for saying so. Yes, yes. So, I mean, we kind of just glazed over there a little bit. And since um, if everyone doesn't already know your story or hasn't read the book yet, why don't we give them the snippet? Because you will get the details in this book. Um, and because there's some questions that I have for you around this, Susie. So why don't you uh, share your story? Yes, of course. Uh, well, I grew up in the UK and my mom's Polish. My dad's English. We moved around a lot. My parents were actually never married. and. I mean, it's almost, I mean, how long have you got, Gina? <laughs> I'll give you, I'll give you my overview. We moved around a lot because my mom was physically afraid of my father. There was domestic violence in our home. He was an alcoholic. He died of addiction when I was 19. We lived in many shelters. I went to many, many schools. I don't remember how many. And I left home when I was 18, went to Australia. Um, got married, got divorced, met my now husband, came to America. So I've been around the block, you know, um, and I think just experienced a lot of different things. And I mean, life is full of different experiences for everybody. They impact us differently. And I feel is the most, imp- the most important thing isn't the experience or the outcome, but just always the, like the blessing, the story, the interpretation that we take, which mm-hmm. is, I, I mean, so beautifully always in our power. And no one else can shape mm-hmm. our story. And so, yeah, I've been, lived in different places, experienced lots of different things, but see blessings in all of it and continue to as things still, even when they don't go my way now, mm-hmm. I always think there's going to be a blessing. Even if I don't feel it in that moment, your history with the universe will always prove to you that there is something waiting. And if you're taking sport too soon, you might think 
something's bad, but I think that we can just relax more into our life. And when we look into our history, that can help us do that. Oh, so ladies, if you're hearing her kind of be like, yeah, there was this and there's domestic violence and there was shelter, like you'll see she's not just sing-songy here. Like she's done the work so that it is not hooking her today. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, what I, what I was so grateful for in reading your book, Susie, is realizing how many of us let our stories or our, our perception of the stories or our association of the stories um, hold us back in adulthood. And you just seem like this, like the sail, your sails are in the wind and you're just <laughs> like, yep, not letting this hold me back. <laughs> well, is it true? Uh, yes. Well, I... I have the, the way that I look at the world, and this is actually Adlerian psychology, Alfred Adler. He says that the present creates the past. All right, let's soak that in. Which the is present funny. creates the past. Tell, tell us more about it. Because we learn through traditional psychology and determinism that what's happened to you in your past creates your present, right? So you have trauma around maybe marriage or money or uh, like really anything, any of our beliefs that aren't helpful. And we like to cling. Right? We like to cling to things that can be, uh, that then just continue to show up for us. For example, just say, I thought, oh my gosh, I can never trust men because, you know, um, men are dangerous and they're unpredictable and we're not safe around them. Then that could be my present, right? And in, in my present moment, that would be serving me somehow. There would be a benefit there. It would mean probably I wouldn't have to be vulnerable and show up in an intimate relationship. I wouldn't have to, use my courage. I wouldn't have to um, you know, take the risk of being myself with somebody. And if we cling to our past to justify any present behaviors, we actually just, we're clinging to something that isn't accurate because we don't always remember the, the past truthfully, first of all. And also, if it's true that there's a cause and effect model, you know, this happens, so then this, that would then mean that every single person like me who had a history like mine could never find a happy marriage could never find a happy relationship. And this cause and effect model, it's really flawed. And I think that it it doesn't help us. And no matter how dig, far we dig back and dig deep, uh, what matters really is now. And the story that we tell now about the past is the only important thing. Wow. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Okay. So I've worked with women for 20 years. And mm -hmm. so oftentimes, one of the excuses, um, but yet it feels very real. One of the excuses that women tell, and I'm outing myself here, like I am, I am to a degree part of the camp I'm about to uh, talk mm -hmm. about is so much of uh, the businesses that we have, they're personal brands and our personal brands are built from our stories. And usually who, what we've overcome and what our stories are and as a result of those, we become the women we are and our stories are linked to other people's stories. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes I'll hear people say like, I don't want to start my business because of what the family will say. Or um, mm -hmm. I know in my own case, I haven't gotten into details about certain stories because those people are still alive. And I'm like, well, is this my place to tell this story? And and then I read yours and I was just like, like, I'm still holding on to that as in a holding back. Mm -hmm. But I just feel like you're just free. So like, how have you come to terms with telling your story, considering that not everybody is still on this planet, but some are and who you've discussed? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's such a good question, Gina, because I feel like a lot of people hold back and they think that... Uh, it's being polite and considerate. And that is true in a lot of cases. I feel like it's almost a bit of a decision because it's still your story too. And you're allowed that. Like you're allowed to have your story. And when we make the focus, I think the people who are going to read or consume, watch, however we present it, what we have to say, if our intention I always think if I, there's something that I know that's true or that I've experienced that's going to be useful then there's a bit of an obligation for me to do that. Because mm -hmm. when you think about it, the people who've inspired you, it's because it's not because they're like kind of hiding, right? Or like pretending that mm -hmm. there's something that, you know, that maybe doesn't feel quite real. It's because they're like, yeah. And then 
And then I had you know, my abortion and it was the hardest thing. And then you're like, oh my gosh, maybe I haven't had that experience, but I've done something where I just really questioned it and I felt guilt and all these things, whatever it may be. And so I feel like when I consider the bigger picture of, you know, not just my family, not, not just, you know, the people in my life, but thinking about, you know, my temporary existence, what I'm here to do, what I feel is in my heart to do, what I've been put here for, then that's my biggest, like that, that's, I have to answer to myself at the end of it all, right? Um, and mm-hmm. so I, 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 I don't want to feel regret there. And then I feel there are also ways that you can be delicate. You can change a, a few names. I mean, there's plenty. I mean, thank you for saying that I left nothing out. I left a lot out. <laughs> More to come. When you referred to your mom. <laughs> oh, I, well, I, re- I actually shared it with her before I published it. And she's, She's like, she's like, it's your story. It's your story. And wow. she's, she's older, you know, she's, and we understand each other in a different way. So our relationship isn't um, perfect, perfect. Best friends like some have with their mom, but that's also okay. Like that's also okay. It's, it's certainly good enough for me. And she understands that I have to do my work. And frankly, it's not a discussion. It's what, what I believe is fair. <laughs> Well, I believe as fair as a human, and then it's it, it's easier for her to be accepting. Was it be, was it a process for you to get to the place within you that it's not a discussion, or are you just yes. like that? Yes, I feel like you do it bit by bit. Like I've been writing articles for years about divorce, about death, about making the wrong decision, about losing friends. About, I mean, all sorts of things. I've and I feel like this is how we chip away, right? It's like you take a little bite of bravery, a bite of bravery. And then suddenly you've taken, you've, like the, the, the pie's gone, right? Like the big fear of fear pie. It's like, well, I mean, there'll, there'll always be a new pie, but I feel as if like these little chipping away, doing, doing like bits and pieces here and there. Um, someone once said to me, if you don't, if I don't feel nervous every time I hit publish, it's crap. Like what I'm putting out is crap. And I mean, I don't always feel really nervous, but I, I like to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Isn't that what we? I, I felt uncomfortable when I submitted the final manuscript for my book. I was like, mm-hmm. should I in, in, include that detail or could I just sh- smooth that over? Or would the story be as compelling if I didn't put in the specifics? Yes. Um, so I definitely get that there for sure. Yeah. Well, I feel so the way that I define confidence is a little bit different, right? Because uh-huh. I feel like everybody, well, we, we all interpret you know, different qualities differently, but when you think about confidence, often you think it's someone who's a really great speaker, right? Or somebody who just is always winning at work or just has it together. And I just, the way that I define it is just simply a willingness to be uncomfortable. That, and when you're willing to be uncomfortable and to get it wrong even, and to be judged and to be disliked, uninvited, whatever it may be, when you're willing for that to be the case, knowing that everything is temporary anyway, it just gives me a lot of peace and a lot of courage to to keep going and frankly just not taking it all so seriously i think that's a big savior too we love to think things are so serious don't we gina we like women right <laughs> life, life and death all the time don't take yourself so seriously i'm like but this is my brand or business or but uh, how much how much is really that dangerous like when you think about it so someone did the wrong instagram okay uh so there was a mistake with a refund there was a mistake with in an email it's really, exactly. it's, not, it's not as dramatic as we think. And it's really unhealthy. It's bad for our nervous system when we think that everything is so dramatic. It's like we're in this constant state of stress, our body becomes addicted. And then what? We have no energy for creativity and pleasure and all the other things that we're meant to enjoy. Oh, you know what? I'm going to, so something happened recently that I, I took really seriously. And, um, it was a conflict with a, a another human and, we had a very different point of view and it wasn't exactly a locking of horns. It wasn't like that, but, um, there was definitely an impasse, shall we say. Mm-hmm. And I didn't like the way things were handled. I didn't like the way it went down. And I told myself, I'm just going to let it go. Mm-hmm. And, and, and on the physical level, I did like, I sent the email. It was like, you know, letting it go. And you know what happened the next day? This has not happened to me in 20, easily 20 years. I got this huge canker sore on the inside of my lip. Uh, And I know enough to know that that's about, you know, like holding Mm -hmm. back anger and resentment. And I was like, oh my goodness, Gina, like this, like talk about like 
we must rise to the higher level. We have got to stop taking the, like at the end of my days or even like two weeks after that situation happened, like, do you think I'm even thinking about it? It's like, and I let my body developed like this cake, like we have got to evolve. I, I'm talking to myself right now to a higher level of emotional mm-hmm. maturity because it is damage to ourselves truly. I don't think we realize either. We think it's really normal sometimes to have back pain or to have headaches or to, we're just so often running on adrenaline. I think too, it's just entrepreneurs. We don't realize a low level anxiety that's mm-hmm. always there. And it's, I think it's fun to be curious because again, we can then get really serious about that, right? <laughs> and it can be a whole nother anxiety cycle. So I think it's really good to, you know, to like play a little, like have, be lighter about things, like be forgiving, be this magnanimous, like just don't worry about it. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's not always possible, right? It's not always easy, but I think that it's easier than we think, than we're willing for it to be. Well, and sometimes true. I swear we're just walking around looking for reasons to be offended and looking for reasons um, to create trouble just because we're used to it too. Mm-hmm. So that can also be a habit that's really helpful to be aware of. Cool, cool. All right. Well, there's so much that people are going to get out of your book, but tell me, why did you write this book? Mm, oh, uh, well, I wanted to write a book like this forever. And I think that after years of working with different people, writing different articles, answering different questions, a big realization that I had was that as human beings, we are resilient, right? Like we know that, Gina, look what the, what we've just gone through in the last six months, mm-hmm. how we've all adapted. Like mm-hmm. human beings are incredible. And at our core, we know that we could survive something, right? Losing money, uh, losing um, a person, like whatever it may be, the things that we fear the most, we know that we'd be okay. The thing that isn't okay with us is the perceived judgment from other people when things don't go our way. Mm-hmm. Like her launch failed, her book didn't do well, her husband left, she's a failure, everything's falling apart, told you she was useless, told you she was stupid, whatever it is that we sometimes believe about ourselves, we know that we can survive, like we can make it through even even on dark days, but we fear the judgment so much of others and that has so much power. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because it's so much of an illusion that people are thinking about us anyway, <laughs> right? I'm not sitting there wondering about someone's launch numbers or <laughs> thinking about someone's book sale, like, you know, you know, I'm not, or criticizing some woman, how she looks in a new pair of jeans, right? Like we're not obsessed with other people. We're just trying to make it through the week ourselves. Um, so first of all, so much of it is an illusion. Um, and then also I think that we don't have the compassion required sometimes to understand that if someone's judging us, it's always a self judgment and that we can look at it with a different lens. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, the, the worst judgments outside of like, I don't know, not the worst judgments. I would say that the, the, the petty judgments that I have been tempted to let myself get taken out of the game on the most Mm. were all from people who hadn't accomplished one one thousandth of what I have Mm. and that they have the audacity to judge, poke, point a finger, complain, Mm. like whatever it is. And I've never had judgment from anyone even close to my level or beyond. And it's like, so it's like, why don't we just get that it is for the projected insecurity and the, the, the whatever else. And yet we're tempted to like drop to that level. Yes. It's, I mean, it's fascinating. I, I included this in my book, but it was actually an interview I did with Chris Jenner from Marie Claire magazine a few years ago that really helped me with this because when our article went live, well, her team tweeted it, they tweeted and tagged um, Marie Claire and me. And I saw all the wrath, like I won't say the, on your lovely podcast, but death threats, sexual animals, like disgusting. And I'm like, you think Chris is reading any of this? She doesn't even know how to log into this account, I bet. <laughs> and whatever you think about that family, I mean, they've done very, very well, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I, I remember just thinking, she doesn't, she doesn't even know. Mm-hmm. And going, huh. And look at, look at her. And she even said, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I care about what God thinks of me. And I, you know, strangers on the internet, it's kind of just not my business. Mm -hmm. And I, that, it just, it really helped me just having that conversation, seeing where she is and seeing the wrath that family gets too. Mm -hmm. Um, And just them really, of course it hurts because, you know, we're human beings and it hurts sometimes, but um, uh, like what, like what's allowed in and what isn't like love in, love out, Mm -hmm. like 
it, that that's not going to work around here. Like, well, that's not going to last around here. Mm-mm. So you wrote this book to help people. Oh, a few things. I think largely a big part of it is taking everything a bit less seriously. Okay. My chapter in there, which is called So What, is probably what I've had the most feedback on because we love to kill ourselves over stuff, right? It's like, it didn't work out today. I'm a bad person. I started a fight. I said a mean thing. Uh, I ran out of dog food, so I gave my dog some of my pasta. Like whatever it is, we're so ready to just um, be so vicious to ourselves and to others. Mm-hmm. And I think if we could just be easier, not only would our health improve, but I think a lot more starts to go your way mm-hmm. when you're willing to not be in a state of stress and the stresses aren't all around you or just perceiving it differently. So personal freedom, being able to become a high level of yourself because your energy isn't used in silly ways. Uh, and then also like the magic of what you can become when you're, I wanted to really highlight what you can do when you don't believe in the limits that other people believe for you. And also when you're just simply willing to be uncomfortable because all emotions are temporary, good and bad. And if the worst thing that can happen is a feeling, then what more could just simply be available to you if you're willing to have some uncomfortable feelings? What would you say are one of the top categories or category that you see other people limit themselves in that you just, you're not available to be limited in? I'm not interested in criticizing myself physically ever, Mm -hmm. ever. And I mean, ever, ever, ever. I mean, I actually, a friend said time recently, I can't remember a single time where you said, I ate too much or I, I, I'm getting, I'm starting to look old or whatever. I am not playing that game. Beautiful. (laughs) Beautiful. I love it. One of the ways that I've seen you do it is around media. What's your relationship with media? Well, the media is available for everybody. I, I think a lot of people don't realize this, right? The media loves well, a lot of people stories. don't think that. Yes, but like, so it's interesting because that never felt like a limitation for me. Can I ask what you think the the limitation is? I mean, I hear lots of different things, but from in my opinion, someone like you, especially with the book coming out, would be a media goal for sure. Well, my book came out March third, twenty twenty. So mm-hmm. that was a uh, we we had a moment there, um, but I can tell you, like before then. I never even tried, I never even tried to go for media. And I, here were probably my two big judgments around it. Um, the, there were two very strong, there were such strong beliefs. They were more like convictions. Like mm-hmm. it wasn't even just a belief. It was like, like I had turned what I'm about to say into fact. Mm-hmm. Um, so something that was around, like, I don't belong on media or media doesn't have people like me on there. Like, oh. you know, like, <laughs> However, like it, it sounds so ludicrous, but it was, um, and, and here's the other good one. I want to know. It's not going to make me money. Mm. Like, like those two are a fact. Like it would be a waste of time. They're not going to have me and it's not going to make me money. So I might as well just focus on my business. Mm. Interesting. Right. Well, it's always just great to be curious about what we think. Right. So, I mean, media doesn't make money. I mean, is that true? Of course not. <laughs> the people who I see, well, the people who I like admire, they're always in the, I'm always consuming their stuff and it's not on their own blog or YouTube channel. Oh, sometimes it is, but you know, they kind of go for bigger audiences if they know that they've got something that can be of use to bigger mm-hmm. audiences. And those vehicles, they're all there. The media needs stories. They need mm-hmm. stories from regular people. So and then I've just the- watched you on these like massive media outlets for years. So I'm, yeah, I'm just curious. Did you always have this view that like, Media is available for everyone, and that includes me? Uh, Well, I started my side hustle as a coach, and I didn't understand how to do any of the technical things. Like, I I was like, I don't, I don't want to run ads. I don't even want to, I don't, I don't know. But I used to read read Mind Body Green, this website. I still, Mm -hmm. I still do. I love that site. And when I was in my cubicle, my background's in tech. I would read these articles and people would have um, productivity advice and advice for forgiveness and advice on, Meditation, all sorts of things. And I was like, well, I've got, you know, something to say about these topics or similar topics. And without overthinking it, I was waiting for my my friend. I'm always early. Uh, and everyone's late. It's fine with me. Uh, but she was late meeting me at a bar. So in the meatpacking district, I wrote 500 words, submitted them to Mind Body Green. And it was live within two weeks. It was shared nearly 4,000 times my first piece. I feel like that was a real universal, um, like piece of information, like keep doing this. Like 
it was free. It was fun. I had an author page. People started really taking me seriously. So I'm like, why isn't everyone doing this? <laughs> it's, it's so, it's fun and easy. It's fun and easy. These are my beliefs, right? So I keep doing it because it works and it drives, drives leads, drives revenue, brings you opportunities, brings you a whole lot of credibility. I, I, I'm open to seeing if there's another way that you could get all of these things in one place, but I haven't found it yet. So I say so it is your, is your favorite platform. Yes. Oh, for sure. Yes. And, and sharing how possible it is because people have such interesting stories and we want to hear them and don't just tell your friends, right. And don't just tell your, your email community. Like you can, if you want more people to benefit from what you know, then why not spend a few minutes pitching yourself to a brand that's maybe over a hundred years old, spent hundreds of millions being built and just tap into their audience. Like I, I, Gina, one thing that I'm convinced with is that everything really is meant to be easier than we mm. allow. I'm convinced of this. And I see it all the time whenever I have that conviction. And yeah, I mean, why not? Why not go where all the people are and all the fun is and all the opportunities, like where they all start to flow. All right. So I feel like the next question I'm going to ask you is like the question that I would normally want to ask you once we stop recording and then like ask you afterwards. So <laughs> okay. Give everyone else the, um, this is like, Gina and, and Susie, girlfriend, like so behind the scenes. Yeah, yes, yes. This is behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, whatever. So, um, my book came out, and I finally I hired a publicist, and I was like, I'm doing mm. this media thing, and I'm not going to say it was be careful what you wish for, but mm. I did probably, I don't know, at least twenty, thirty morning shows. Mm -hmm. I dreaded it. Mm. And, and here, like, I, like, I hear you like talking about, it, like, I have a, I have something to say about this. And I have a story to tell. And I'm thinking like, that wasn't any of my experience. Like I, they, like I had these like three stupid bullet points that were going to change <laughs> nobody's life. And they wanted me to talk about these talking points that was like, it was so damn boring to me. I couldn't imagine who would be like sitting at home with their cup of coffee being like, wow, I'm going to go check that person out. Mm. And I'm like, so I, and then I got on podcasts and I just found like the medium of podcasts. I, like I would look at my calendar and I'd see like TV interview, TV interview, TV interview. And I'd be like, oh, and I'd be like one podcast. And I'd be like, yes. Mm. So I'm like, did, do you not have that experience? Uh -huh. My experience is different. The, Tell well, me. The <laughs> well, the TV format is limited. You have like a seven minute segment on average and they, and the way a producer works is it's, it's, it's tight. Like it's scripted and your publicist did her job, right? She got you the placements. So oh yeah. Job. No, no, yeah. no. I mean, that's what yeah, I yeah. asked for. Of yeah. course. Yes. And um, maybe it's kind of like finding the right media for you. My favorite type of media is writing articles. So I love it all. I'll do it all happily, but I love writing articles because in my opinion, nothing can really move a person like the written word. And frankly, it's, it's more business savvy because there is nothing like a frictionless link in an article. So if I write a piece about whatever it is, confidence um, or confidence mistakes at work that women make, and then I write my piece and then it goes straight to what we call a shirt tail in the media. So my two line bio, Susie Moore is an ex who does Y, download her ex here, leading to an evergreen webinar funnel. Then it's, this is whether the money comes immediately. So for me, that's the preferred, the preferred method because I love to write. And well, I never used to. I do now because I'm used to it. And uh, it's also the most lucrative. So it's cheaper than Facebook ads. <laughs> well, you can do both. You can run Facebook ads to your media pieces too. It's it's a candy store, Gina. The things that you, I the things love your attitude, girl. I need to like I need to like readjust my crown here and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, take a look around. So, um, tell everyone about your business. So what's your business mm -hmm. and what do you do so people know how they can work with you? Yes. I essentially, my superpower is I, I can help people understand what's limiting them so that they, they can become more confident in various life areas. Increasingly, there's been a lot of demand for this with visibility in business, which is why I work so much with the media and help, um, help with that. But yeah, I care most about like a freedom based, joyous life and preaching about this, knowing that it's possible, sharing the embarrassing stories. I'm working on my third book now, Gina, which is very exciting because I love, I mean, oh, I love, 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's addictive, all of this stuff. Uh, yeah, I think that really what it is that I, I most care about is um, being able to help people see the limits that they have that are self-imposed. And in a fun way, not a heavy way, we don't have to be heavy to heal, right? But just like questioning things, choosing another, seeing a situation differently, maybe choosing a better story. Um, that's, that's where I, that's what I love to do the most. And on my site, I have a whole lot of free confidence resources just at suzy-more.com. Suzy-more.com. All right. We'll have everything in the show notes and, and, and give all the links at the end as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so helping people get visible in business and be confident in their visibility out there mm-hmm. in the world is what you do. Yes, because sometimes I think that the beliefs that show up, they're not like the real belief, right? There's like something else there. And like it, media of course, doesn't make money or <laughs> people like me on it. <laughs> well, and but that's the thing. Once you kind of get more and more used to it, you'll just, if, if, when, you, when you have your next TV interview and you have your three points to talk about a morning routine or something, you'll say, and in my book, and in my book, like you'll just, you'll know, <laughs> you know, we experiences everything, right? It's like the confidence competence loop mm-hmm. that we always speak about in coaching. The more you do something, the more competent you become naturally, the more competence, the more confidence. So just, this is why I'm just, I always have this huge bias towards action versus mm-hmm. thinking. Thinking can only get you Oh, so yes. 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 <laughs> I, we need to make a meme out of that and, and quote you. I have a bias towards action versus overthinking. That's great. <laughs> Well, I tell you, and this is how you produce. Like I, I saw a post from Eugenia, busy is boring. I, I snapshotted it. I'm like, yes, I'm going to use this. Of course, I'll credit you. Um, <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, busy is boring. It's really, really boring. It's old. It's dull. It's an excuse. I'm not interested. And I'm not interested in hearing about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How busy is Are you producing or not producing? Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So speaking of producing, you know, we've all just not sat through, but pivoted through, well, maybe some sat, some pivoted but through this global pause. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, you know, for women like us, we couldn't not ask mm-hmm. what is, what's really going on? Not like what's mm-hmm. the new task, but like what's really going on and what's next for us and what's, you know, once we get out of the frustration of wearing a mask outside or whatever, but it's like, what's really the invitation where do you see yourself um, evolving next as a result? Maybe that you hadn't seen before the pandemic. Has, has the pandemic shaken you up or have you already, are you like on the trajectory that you always knew you would be? Where are you at with that conversation? I feel as if the biggest shift for me has been a positive one because I feel as if old bro ways of coaching are over. Tell me more. So you know how traditional coaching in some models is like, okay, 10 steps to success. And this is, what does it look like? I feel like the shift is now like, what does it feel like? Mm-hmm. Being successful? Keep talking. Like this, for it to be so much deeper because we can't go outside. We can't live. We can't do all the things we normally do. So we have to go inside, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Figuratively, metaphorically. Mm-hmm. But it's like, with so many privileges that we normally have, just like being removed, like right? being really faced to force ourselves. I mean, I just wrote a Cosmo article, which is out in November, speaking about like, is this pandemic aging us? Like what's going on? And there are so, like you're taking a really like close look at your mate right now, if you're living with somebody at home, right? And you're taking a, an account of like you, your day-to-day life, your habits and routines, because they've shifted. You, you can just really monitor them. There's no really escaping just, you know, mm-hmm. yourself. Mm-hmm. And so I feel as if this is giving more and more rise to the divine feminine, caring more about how we feel and making it less about just a rush and mm. this busy, boring life and just like the go, go, go. It's almost like, I mean, no one's happy this pandemic has happened. You know, happened. There's been so much tragedy, but this is a miracle in some way too, this complete mm-hmm. loss that we've been given. Lives like, I know people whose lives have completely changed. They've moved. They've left the city. They probably would, they would have waited till they had kids. Mm-hmm. They, uh, I, a very close friend of mine, he's been in real estate for 25 years, like six days a week, pounds in the pavement. He's changed. Mm-hmm. This never would have happened. Like mm-hmm. it's like this acceleration year. And I feel as if there are, there are hidden blessings in anything. For and sure. For me, it's, I think there's been a real big rise of feeling and people speaking more confidently about feelings and not just, um, 
what something looks like on the outside, but thinking, but, but going a little deeper within ourselves. Beautiful, beautiful. You agree with that? Well, I've never been a 10 step process kind of person. So <laughs> even when it was like the thing, I was never that thing. I tried to do it for like a minute. Um, like I tried to be popular for a minute, that, but neither of them worked out for me, uh, like in high school, I mean. So um, <laughs> I think that I love hearing it because so much of the conversation here at Divine Living is is about being more versus doing more. And it's about being more feminine. And so much of the shift that I've been making in terms of the conversation is, okay, we've gotten divine working down. A lot of us are not everybody. Some people are still stuck in jobs that they don't like and they're looking for something better, uh, a better, more aligned purpose. A lot of the entrepreneurs, like we've gotten divine working down, but what about divine living mm-hmm. and returning to some of the feminine arts and prioritizing play, pleasure, like, like whatever living is to you. Is it painting? Is it dancing? Is it the beach walk? Is it, um, cooking? You know, like just, really, you know, as much as is responsible or we can right now, like time with girlfriends or um, whatever it is. So I think that hearing that that's your slice of it is, is really um, exciting to me. I, I mean, I think so too. And I, I, I just can't get away from the fact that I just, I don't think that this would have happened. Something dramatic at something dramatic had to shift for us to shift and to see Mm -hmm. a different way of looking at the world and to also frankly realize that we're I mean uncertainty is part of life right I know we can all feel very powerless right now in addition with everything going on but we have complete power within us like within I could not believe when everyone was like in these uncertain times I'm thinking like that is probably one of my most favorite words like I get I clench up when things are too certain and too rigid it's like I dance much more and I breathe more deeply and the spontaneity and the, and my husband, he's so like the empowered masculine. It's like, I even say like, Oh, was thinking of going to where he's like booking plane tickets. And I'm like, it was just uh, like, I don't like, Hey, do you want to do like sushi on Friday? But what if I feel like Mexican instead? Like, you know, um, so I, uh, uncertainty is not a scary thing for me. Mm, And the thing is you kind of haven't got a choice because uncertainty is, Life. Well, then there's that. Yeah. <laughs> well, but it's so good. Good that you like it, right? But it's like so often we think all of a sudden it's uncertain. It's always been uncertain, right? right? It's like well, any time that we think that we have been able to control our lives and what's going on, it's like like taking over the God job. It's mm-hmm. um, it's it's not a job I want. That's that's for sure. That's why I so much prefer the the feminine and the spontaneity and the you know, ability to see things not as they are, but as they could be and mm-hmm. being in that, that creative vortex. And when you are willing to embrace change, then you, there isn't suffering, mm-hmm. right? Cause so, cause you only lose what you cling to, right? Whatever it, it is like a way of living or a fixed routine. Uh, like where is the loss, right? The loss is a perceived, but is a perception like that there is a loss here. And, I think that when we can embrace change, embrace the permanent uncertainty that has always been and always will be, then this is also where a lot of freedom is and fun. And I think this is also what makes someone a magnetic person because they're not, you know, you know, when someone's like, gotta, gotta be this way, very rigid. It's like in nature that doesn't survive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so when we can, you know, be a bit lighter about it, be more flexible, al- allow it, allow things to be. Yes. Like, like you said, not doing the God job. I don't want that job. Oh, oh <laughs> I've got enough going on. <laughs> right. Sure. And just us conditioning ourselves that like, it's all happening for us, not to us. It's all happening for us, not to us. And, you know, I've gotten like, I remember like something happened recently. I forget what it was. I wasn't invited to something. I forget. And like, mm. I, I noticed like the, the, not the old, like the younger Gina, actually, like, like the old Gina would have been like tempted to get my feelings hurt. And I've like, as a result of writing my book, I've really conditioned myself. And that's like, oh, okay. I wasn't meant to do that Sunday afternoon. Like, so what is meant for me? And it's just like kind of quickly, uh, like really getting how much we're being guided. I had, um, 
you know, a, a team member sub- submit a resignation. And in the past, I would have been like, oh God, this is the worst time in the middle of a launch, like, like and resentful and like, like put so much into the training. And like, and I just immediately was like, oh, wow. I wonder who's going to fill the position next. It's like, just knowing that it's like, ah, the universe is doing things that, and once you've conditioned yourself, that it's only for your good, that only good can come from it. You just get to be in the state of curiosity and playfulness. And as you say, not taking yourself so seriously. Oh, I, I swear that the, the ego is at its worst when we're taking everything personally, really mm-hmm. anything actually personally. Mm-hmm. This is the ego at its worst. The ego also at its worst is when we think that we're not as good as other people. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, because I speak a lot about confidence and write about confidence, people say, can't you be too confident? And I'm like, you know, that there's not a problem with that. <laughs> there isn't this overconfidence, right? That's really a problem we need to solve. Right. <laughs> and we can often just think that would be ego, but it's not. Right. And when we're like, someone resigned, it's about me. Um, someone didn't invite me. It's about me. We have no idea what's going on. Exactly. No exactly. Idea. Someone might be like, I mean, I, I always love these stories because, um, if ever there's an example where I, I got worked up about something and it turns out that someone actually, they were in hospital, right? Or I thought someone didn't get back to, and it's like, you know, she actually, um, she's really going through a hard time with her husband, right? And I'm like, well, I just thought, cause, cause I'm the center of everything. <laughs> in, my, in my movie, I am, right? But everyone else has their completely different movie and we just play, like, we play a part in that movie and nothing is the same. We don't see any of it the same. Mm-hmm. Which is also helps you be really accepting of other people. Um, but it's whenever I think I'm taking something personally, I realize that my ego is just like having a field day. And mm-hmm. I'm like, isn't it so funny that everything is about me? Everything everyone does or decides is about me. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it, it can, it can become quite funny uh, when you start to do this regularly. Mm-hmm. So completely switching gears here. So I hear you live in Florida. In Miami, yeah. In Miami. <laughs> Tell me about how long have you lived in Miami? It's been one year now. So we left New York after 10 years last summer. And now there are a lot of New Yorkers here. That's what I'm hearing. Yes, I tell you. I mean, New York will always be number one, in my opinion, right? But it's, I think it's also good to have a change. And if you've lived in different countries or, um, even if you live in different places, I think that you, it's something that you kind of, you like, right? It adds to your life experience. And what I like about Miami is uh, this big Latin community here, right? It's all about pleasure, right? It's not, it's not work, work, work. It's a little different. And it's also just so physically gorgeous. Yes. You've got a different gorgeousness, right? But it's just like, it really is palm trees blue. I mean, and I'm from England, right? So <laughs> we think the sun, like we, I sunbathe without sunscreen. Like <laughs> this is, I mean, <laughs> I know you shouldn't do that, but I still like doing it. So for me, I just feel like it's heaven. And if, if anyone um says to me, oh, I'm thinking of moving, I always just say, go. If you've had the inclination longer than even, you know, a couple of months, then like, why, why do we cling to where we live so much? Like, like why right. You- How long did it take you? To, when did you have the idea to move to Miami? Well, my husband wanted to for a long time. He wanted to um, live somewhere else. And I was like, no, because New York is, is such an identity place too. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then once we kind of were seriously considering it, like a, a couple of weeks. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Super cool. Super I know. Cool. Yeah. Why wait? Why wait? Well, what a, what a beautiful place to, to live and has certainly have been for during this past time when being in New York wouldn't have been much fun this year. Yes. Yes. And I think like if everything's kind of slowly coming back, like there's a new dynamism. So yeah, I think it's, it's important to kind of, to follow your heart when it comes to all things, right? Not just your career mm-hmm. or your, ma- you know, whoever you marry, you decide to get married. It's not for everybody, but like even small things like, you know, do I want to be here anymore? Do I, do I, do I even need a break? We thought we'd be here for a couple of years, but I don't know. We're kind of, we're kind of into it. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, speaking of following your heart, what is next for you? You're already working on your next book, but what do you see is, is coming up or really lighting you up? What's new mm. around the corner? You know, kind of going back to media, I feel like the message, like messages that I want to share, I just want to have bigger and bigger audiences. And this is my goal. That's why I'm still consistently always pitching myself, always out there. And I feel as if, I mean, I don't know, for anyone who's authored a book, you know that it's a lot of work for not a huge return, right? In most cases. Yet. 
<laughs> right. Well, not for compared to many other options that you have with a very quick return, etc. Yes. Um, but I feel like if if um, if you have books to write that are within, like you know, within you, then that's I mean, that's what is certainly most exciting to me. And then exploring new and bigger audiences in different ways. And what I think I love about creativity too is once you kind of release something, there's space for the new ideas. Mm-hmm. But you can't do it until the idea is out. You know, like if someone has an idea forever for a book, they won't get the next idea until that, that book's created. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Yep. So you've got to like, just like really keep releasing it. And cause I'm still creating a lot at the moment. Um, I just feel like I have lots of ideas and I'm just excited uh, to keep, keep going. Cool. 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 Well, Susie, it has been such a blessing to have you on this podcast. Such, such a delight to get to meet you and just connect with you. I know that this is just the beginning of many, many amazing conversations for us to come. So give everyone your links where they can follow you on social, um, where they can sign up to be on your newsletter list or whatever you've got. Uh, let's. I keep it really simple. My best confidence resources are just free on my site, susie-moore.com. And I'm on YouTube and Instagram, pretty much just my name. I'm easy to find. Great, great. And we'll have all of her links in the show notes. Susie, congratulations on this book. Stop checking your likes, shake off the need for approval and live an incredible life. Ladies, run, don't walk. And Susie, thank you again. Thank you so much, Gina.